from cutting tape and, to, and from listening to other people's work, I came to feel like you don't want to structure a story like an argument. You want to structure it with the structure that I thought really that I invented. Um, but then came to find out, no, it's actually quite common. And what the structure is, is that there would be um, narrative motion. Things would happen. This would happen, it would lead to this, and it would lead to this, and it would lead to this. And, then, um, and so you have the forward momentum of things happening. Um, and, and then every now and then, you leave the action to s say something about it, to have some thought about it. So the structure of it is anecdote, and then a moment of reflection, and then another anecdote. And um, like when I give seminars to reporters, I play, I play this story that was on our show where, where the plot of it is that there's a guy who, uh, who works at this office, and there's a 12-year-old who comes to the office. Somebody's kid comes to the office every now and then. And he's a good kid. Um, they would joke around. He would con around with her. And one day he goes into the bathroom and he he's got his, comes out of the bathroom with glasses in his pocket and he sees, he sees the little kid down the hall. So he starts um, uh, kind of clowning around in the hall, putting his hands like claws and wandering down the hall towards the girl saying like, you know, I didn't expect to see you here. And, and I say, when I'm talking to reporters, like, okay, at that point, like nobody turns off the radio, you know? Nobody turns off the radio, but if you think about it, it's an incredibly banal story. Like, like, like you know, it's a story about somebody coming out of a bathroom in their office. Like, there's nothing to it as narrative. You know, like it has none of the stage props of a great story. Um, but you'd it, you'd be hard pressed to turn it off f from the radio because you can feel that it has emotion. You could tell that this is a story with a destination. You could tell that the glasses in the pocket. Are, are the X factor that mean that when he gets down to the end of the hall, it is not going to all work out for him the way he's, you know, you can just feel through, through, through the motion of this that, that it's a train and a station heading out towards a destination. And understanding that, like once I understood that, like whenever I had any kind of tape uh, in my interviews and then in, in structuring the stories, I feel like I divided it off in my head to like, this is the action part of the story and this is the thought part of the story. And as a staff, when we talk about stories with each other, because at some point you have to be able to communicate to each other about like, is this working, is this working? What do you think of this part? What do you think of this part? That's the way we talk to each other is like, there's too much action and you need another thought here. But now this is too many thoughts in a row, like get rid of this and this. The laws of narrative are the laws of narrative. You know what I mean? And what engages us is simply what engages us, you know what I mean? Like there's some things about a story and about characters you can relate to and situations that e evoke a feeling and, and then the most traditional kinds of plot structure. I, I mean, on our show, like, you know, we are, we're like, we tell stories the way you learn a story should be told when you're in third grade, where there's like rising action and <laughs> something happens in the end and then a little denouement and, you know, <laughs> moment of reflection and pause. Like, it's the most simple kind of storytelling. And I thought I invented this structure of, like, some action and then a moment of reflection and some action and a moment of reflection. And then I was, uh, I, was I went home to, um, to Baltimore, where I'm from, for the high holidays and uh, uh, Jewish high holidays. And I went to the, this uh, s services where the rabbi was, who was the rabbi I used to go to when I was a kid. And, um, it, and uh, that rabbi, his name was Seymour Estrog, was a total entertainment package. Like, that guy could really give a sermon. And he was funny, and he would, it was got, you know, a little story from the Bible, but then also, like, seeing some movies he had just seen, and something he'd been reading, and just like, you know, like any great sermon, right? And like, and, and at the end, he's like, you know, here's what we're gonna do with this this week. Like, here's the, what we're gonna carry with us, and we walk out that door, and just like, like, and also, yeah, and just he was like, just like an incredible performer. Like we were in Baltimore, and he was, um, he was from New York. He had this thick New York accent, and so if you're from Baltimore, we always felt like, well, we have, a, like, he sounded like a real Jew to us, like, you know what I mean, because of the New York accent, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and anyway, so like as he's giving his sermon, like, like my radio show had been on the air for like four or five years at that point, and he's, I'm listening to his sermon, and I'm like taking apart the structure of his sermon in my head because, because I'm compulsive. And, um, and I realized at some point, like, this has the same structure as my radio show. And then, since then, I've talked to people who have been to seminary, and they say, every sermon has the structure of your radio show. That is the structure. You, you, you invented the oldest thing there is. And I always felt like, no, no, I, I personally made this up. <laughs>